This is The Killer Chronicles. It was November 28th, 2007, and a Texas federal prison complex known as FCC Beaumont was in shambles. A building had flooded. The guards were short-staffed. Someone had been pulling fire alarms throughout the day. And by the early afternoon, inmates had been involved in a physical altercation, further distracting the already overburdened COs. FCC Beaumont was a violent place. A trio of prisons that collectively held 7,000 inmates, including maximum security prisoners, it had seen several homicides in recent years. Guards also had a reputation for committing flagrant misdeeds, like deliberately setting off cage match gladiator fights between prisoners for their own amusement. Typically, the violence was limited to fights among inmates. This day would be a major exception. It all started around 2.50 p.m. when three guards were escorting inmates Mark Isaac Snar and Edgar Baltazar Garcia back to their cells from recreational cages in the Segregated Housing Unit, or SHU. The escort itself was a violation of protocol, as both inmates were supposed to be accompanied by three guards apiece due to their long history of violence behind bars. But when Snar told the guards that he had to use the bathroom, they decided to move both inmates at once with half the required staff. During the walk back, Snar and Garcia slipped their handcuffs almost in unison using contraband lockpicks and pulled out two sharp metal shanks. Corrections officer Dwight Baloney believed Snar was about to attack Garcia and bravely tried to shield the inmate with his own body, only to find himself being stabbed by both men in his front and back. They hit him with their knives 20 times, yelling at him to give up his cell keys as he desperately tried to fight them off. During the struggle, two other guards, Josh McQueen and Edwin Levine, turned tail and ran for the large steel range door, leaving their colleague behind. Baloney was able to make his way out to the door as well, and all five men converged there. Baloney escaped, badly wounded, but Snar and Garcia got a hold of McQueen and turned their knives on him. They knocked him down and stabbed him repeatedly, then pulled his keys loose from his tool belt. It was then that Snar and Garcia headed for their real target, another inmate named Gabriel Roan. As they walked down the range, Garcia waved his shank and taunted inmates who were locked away in their cells. They arrived at Roan's cell, unlocked his door, and swung it open. Roan tried to flee, but it was no use. The two stabbed him 50 times in the back and the chest, striking his lungs, liver, and heart, and inflicting multiple fatal wounds. One inmate would later say that they turned him to pulp. Guards outside pleaded with the two to stop the attack, yelling out, he's dead, it's over. But Snar and Garcia wouldn't stop until they got blasted with aerosol gas. They gave up their weapons, surrendered, and later apologized for stabbing McQueen and Baloney, telling investigators that it wasn't supposed to go down like that. The entire incident lasted just three minutes. By the time the court process was over, Snar and Garcia had been sentenced to death. Roan's killing wasn't a random homicide, but rather a coordinated attack by a skinhead gang called the Soldiers of Aryan Culture, or SAC which has become known as one of the most violent and notorious criminal organizations in the Midwest. Recruiting inmates who fall in line with the SAC's hardline racist dogma that's even more extreme than many other all-white prison gangs. The Soldiers of Aryan Culture was started in the late 1990s in Utah. There are conflicting reports of how it started, but by most accounts, the gang was formulated by this guy, Tracy Swena, aka Tin Man a Utah resident who found himself in federal prison on weapons charges. An unconfirmed report says that a fellow prisoner with ties to the Aryan Brotherhood exposed Swena to a white power ideology. But whatever the case, by 2001, Swena had written and distributed literature that clearly spelled out the gang's philosophy. Quote, We are skinheads in all definitions of this term. We are soldiers consumed by our political, ethnic, and blood identities that make us brothers and sisters in the truest and purest form. For you are eternally your brother's or sister's keeper, and bound by blood, oath, and honor to defend the integrity of our eternal white family. He added that members must display, quote, loyalty, courage, 
ethnic pride, and a diligent effort to preserve, promote, and honor pure white power. In many ways, the SAC operates like a typical prison gang. They sell drugs and engage in other illegal hustles. They'll attack inmates who have been deemed no good on site, like child molesters, police informants, or people who cross other codes of conduct in the criminal world. They have a paramilitary type structure with soldiers, lieutenants, and generals. They don't tolerate weakness or disobedience among their ranks, and they protect their symbol, a swastika wrapped around an iron cross. No one is allowed to tattoo an SAC patch on themselves unless they're a made member, which can only happen after a probate period where they're required to put in work. Though the specific symbols, dogma, and ranks vary from gang to gang, this basic structure could be used to describe almost any criminal group that has started in American prisons. But here's one thing that sets the SAC apart. The gang has been suspected of at least one domestic terror plot. In May 2002, police in Ogden, Utah, claimed that they thwarted plans by the SAC and another skinhead gang, Silent Aryan Warriors, to mail pipe bombs to Jewish athletes before the Winter Olympics. Had this alleged plot gone through, it is hard to imagine the fallout that would have followed in an already paranoid, post-9-11 America that was already pouring billions of dollars towards fighting terrorism overseas. In 2003, the SAC made national headlines when federal prosecutors in Utah indicted a dozen members, including Suena, on racketeering charges. Though no actual murders were linked to the group in that case, authorities tied them to 11 conspiracies to commit murder, which resulted in attempted killings where the victims survived. Many of the victims were members of the Norteños, a Latin American gang that started in Northern California, but like the SAC has spread all over, due to the practice of federal prosecutors locking up their high-ranking members and moving them to prisons across America. During the case, an SAC member was convicted of threatening federal prosecutors in a letter that listed an assistant U.S. attorney's home address and contained a menacing message. Quote, you stupid bitch, it's because of you my brothers are in jail for RICO. We will get you. By the case's end, charges had been dismissed against two of the SAC members for lack of evidence, but the other ten were sentenced to prison terms ranging from 19 months to 20 years. Among those who received football numbers was Mark Isaac Snar, the SAC lieutenant who would go on to murder Gabriel Roan and stab officers McQueen and Baloney just three years later. Prosecutors believed they singled out Roan as a target for three reasons. He had recently masturbated onto a female guard, which angered Snar and Garcia. He was Muslim, and he was a known loudmouth who would scream taunts from his cell. Garcia allegedly told an inmate that, quote, while Roan was talking, I was sharpening my knife. But setting that aside, according to the Fed's own account of what happened, the guards involved were outsmarted by the SAC. Snar's ruse of having to use the bathroom tricked them into breaking protocol and transporting both inmates together with only two guards on one of them and one on the other, when they each should have had three escorts. The guards also decided to escort Snar and Garcia before other inmates because other SAC associates present were being belligerent and refusing to move, acts that prosecutors later called a ruse to ensure Garcia and Snar would go first. Jurors convicted Garcia and Snar of capital murder after just an hour of deliberating. Seven years after Roan was stabbed, history repeated itself in a nearly identical murder committed by the SAC. This time, the victim was a fellow SAC member, Leo Johns, who was stabbed to death by SAC Lieutenant Christopher Kramer and a lower-ranking member, Ricky Fackrell. Kramer both ordered the murder and helped carry it out, and Johns was warned several times for violating SAC rules. He had stolen from a cellmate, racked up drug debts with other gangs, and the final straw was flouting an order by Kramer to stay off drugs and alcohol, given his history of obnoxious and erratic behavior when he failed to stay sober. 
Johns was murdered on June 9th, 2014 at USP Beaumont. But the planning started three months earlier when Kramer began recruiting a second hitman for the job. He eventually settled on Fackrell and used SAC member Michael Shelton as a lookout. Like the Roan murder, Kramer and Fackrell were able to get away with prison rule violations that, had they been detected, could have prevented the violence from taking place. In this case, they snuck into a part of the prison, Area DA, that they weren't supposed to be allowed in. That's where Johns, Shelton, and more than a dozen other inmates lived. On the morning he was murdered, Johns was cooking up a batch of pruno in a cell. At 9 a.m., Kramer and Fackrell approached him in DA cell 224. There, they pulled out two shanks, known as bone crushers, that had been cut from the same piece of metal and went to work on Johns, stabbing him more than 70 times in another clear example of SAC overkill. Johns pleaded for his life, telling them, quote, that's enough, but they ignored him. During the stabbing, a guard made his way around the module and passed by cell 224 several times, blissfully unaware of the carnage, while Shelton kept watch outside. When they believed Johns was dead, Kramer and Fackrell left the cell and gave their knives to Shelton for disposal. But Johns was still breathing and began to move. Then he opened the cell door. When Kramer noticed this, he returned to cell 224 and finished the grisly murder without a weapon. Stomping on John's head and dragging him underneath the cell's bunk bed, where his body wasn't to be discovered by guards until two hours after the attack began. When Kramer was arrested, he was at a chow hall joking about the murder with other inmates. He tried to claim the attack was self-defense, pointing to a cut on his elbow he said was caused by John's. In reality, Fackrell accidentally stabbed Kramer, and the two laughed about the quote, friendly fire afterwards, with Kramer going so far as to boast that the cut would quote, save my life. As it turned out, Kramer and Fackrell would both be convicted and sentenced to death four years later, after nine other prisoners, including former SAC members, agreed to testify on behalf of the prosecution. But three months after Johns was murdered, Fackrell would kill again, in the same prison and in concert with another member of the SAC. In September 2014, Fackrell and SAC member Eric Reckonen were placed in an SHU recreational cage with a third inmate, Ronald Earl Griffith Jr., who was there serving a 51-month term for domestic violence on the federal Isabella Reservation for the Saginaw Chippewa Native American tribe. Reckonen punched and kicked Griffith, knocking him down, while Fackrell stomped on his head numerous times. Griffith sustained brain injuries so serious that he was knocked into a coma and never recovered. He died five months later in February 2015 of complications from the beating. Reckonen was only charged with assault and received a 10-year prison term. Fackrell wasn't formally charged with Griffith's killing, but prosecutors used it to secure a death sentence against him in the Johns case. During the investigation, it was revealed that an SAC member sent Griffith a note, luring him into recreation by assuring him that he wouldn't be targeted for violence. The murder of Johns prompted a federal lawsuit by his family that accused USP Beaumont of, quote, failing to be vigilant, and brought up the alleged practices of guards arranging gladiator fights between inmates, and once placing a federal drug defendant in a recreational cage with a convicted murderer who killed him with a single kick to the head. The suit was settled out of court within months of being filed but it's noticeable that in their defense of the lawsuit and in the prosecution of Kramer and Fackrell, the feds took completely opposite positions. Federal prosecutors told a sympathetic story to the jury about how Johns was killed because, quote, his only crime was being an addict, and that he was essentially preyed upon by vicious gang-affiliated killers. In the civil courthouse, however, attorneys representing the United States said in court documents, quote, Inmate Leo Johns was responsible for his death on June 9, 2014, due to his actions and interactions with the SAC gang prior to the homicide at USP Beaumont, essentially blaming Johns for jumping in front of his killer's knives 70 times. 
The stories behind these murders reveal not just plots by a gang that carries out violence with cunning precision, but failures within the federal prison system that ultimately placed the victims in harm's way. Evidence showed that in John's murder, Kramer and Fackrell waited until a particular guard was on the module, knowing that he was more unobservant than his colleagues. And in Roan's case, the murder would not have been possible but for several policy violations. That having been said, it's undeniable that Officer Baloney showed great courage that day, first by shielding Garcia with his own body when he thought Snar was about to stab him, then by holding on for dear life to his tool belt while he was stabbed nearly two dozen times. Today, the SAC continues to be a scourge, both inside and outside of Utah, and prosecutors continue to play the cat and mouse game with the gang. Most recently, in October 2020, the U.S. Attorney's Office indicted 21 members and associates of the SAC, the Silent Aryan Warriors, and the Noble Elect Thugs, on charges of drug and gun sales. Meanwhile, after two decades behind bars, the SAC's top general and founder, Tracy David Swena, was released to federal probation in Colorado in March 2021. He remains free, with just under three years left on his supervised release term. That's it for today. Please like, subscribe, and follow. Thank you for listening.